earlier. I'm Emilio Kincari. I'm currently attending UMBC. Uh, I'm a what I would call an amateur naturalist, and I will be giving a presentation about the importance of crayfish and other crustaceans within the state of Maryland. So obviously the first question is, what actually are crustaceans? That's sort of the base question that we have to, that we have to answer here. So you, we have insects, arachnids, um, myriapods, and crustaceans, which are all arthropods. Um, you know, insects like butterflies, arachnids like spiders, scorpions, and myri myriapods like, um, like millipedes and centipedes. Those are all arthropods and they're all invertebrates. And invertebrates don't have a backbone and they have a exoskeleton rather than an endoskeleton, uh, which uh, us humans and all other vertebrate animals have. Uh, and crustaceans are quite an expansive group, over 42,000 species in there. And there you see our, our probably our most famous crustacean, the Atlantic blue crab. Next, of course, since this presentation has such a focus on crayfish, we need to answer what are crayfish. <laughs> so crayfish, crabs, and shrimp are all decapods within the arthropod group that I mentioned earlier. And decapod means 10-legged, as you can see down there by that little devil crayfish. They have eight legs and two pairs of claws. And all of Maryland's crayfish are in the Cambaridae family. Uh, they're also very closely related to lobsters. As you can tell, they very closely resemble them. Um, crayfish have also been gone by many names, depending on where you are. Uh, here they are very often called crawdads or crawfish, but other places call them mud bugs or rock lobsters or mountain lobsters. <laughs> they have plenty of names, but uh, their proper name would be crayfish, which is what I will be referring to them as today. So of course, now we have to go over the life cycle as <laughs> an important aspect of crayfish. And as practically all invertebrates, they begin their lives directly as eggs. And the female stores them actually under her tail and fans them and keeps them protected until they've hatched. And even once they do hatch, the larval crayfish stay underneath the tail in a sort of pocket in a ball, all huddled together until they're large enough to, to detach from the mother and they seek out some shelter in aquatic vegetation or some rocky areas. And if they uh, avoid being eaten for long enough, then they will, of course, be able to molt several times and reach their adult size, in which they are able to breed and starts the whole life cycle over again. So then a very important, oops, very important. Another good aspect to, to understand when it comes to crayfish because crayfish tend to be very difficult to identify is all the different parts of them. Now you have just a little very oversimplified diagram. Obviously there's a lot more parts to crayfish than just these, but I've tried to make it as easily digestible as I can really. So of course you have the abdomen, the tail, the very uh, signature aspect, signature feature of crayfish and lobsters. Of course, as I'm sure many of you are aware, you have the areola down in the center there. It's that sort of hourglass shape, uh, and it can be narrow or wide, depending on the species. And then you have the rostrum, which is the nose portion, you could say, between the eyes. That varies in shape. That's very important. And then you have the carapace, which makes up the, uh, the middle section of the animal. Of course, you have the legs and you have the cello, which are the claws. And I've got here a very simplified key for identifying crayfish genus, genera rather, in Maryland. So on the left, we've got, uh, as I said in the previous slide, you look at the rostrum first, that's very important. 
if you have more of an arrow shaped rostrum, it's more shortened, then you have either cambrous or lacuna cambrous. And if you have on the on the right, a more elongated pencil shape with those distinctive spines uh, towards the end of the point, then you likely have faxonius or procambrous. So first we will go over the former group, which is cambrous. We have the probably what is the one of the most common native crayfish, if if not the most common native crayfish in Maryland, which is the common crayfish, Cambrus bartonii, which occur in a multitude of drainages all over the state. Um, but mostly within the Piedmont and the montane regions. And then you have um, it's very, very close relative. I mean, as you can see there, they look practically identical. Uh, the rock crayfish, which is only in the Okagani River drainage in Garrett County, which is all the way in our westernmost county. Uh, both are really, really sensitive to pollution, however, and they've, they've faced pretty heavy population declines, especially in places where virile and rusty crayfish occur. And we will go over those two species shortly. Um, Regardless, both are, are known for their proficiency in breaking down submerged vegetation and decaying material. They're very good at that. And they're honestly very instrumental in just maintaining balance in these aquatic ecosystems. The, the idea of balance is something that's going to come up a lot in this presentation because crayfish are very good at maintaining that in a variety of ways. And you'll get a better idea of how they do that soon. Uh, next we have, we're going to go over our rarest crayfish that we have, which is the assuminate crayfish, Cambrus assuminatus, which is ranked as S2, uh, state imperiled. It's, it's quite rare. I've only seen them once. <laughs> uh, but they are found in a variety of different habitats, not necessarily in a lot of different sites. Their populations have, have faced pretty heavy declines, especially due to the invasive uh, crayfish that we will mention um, soon. And pollution, they, they seem particularly, uh, particularly sensitive. They used to be far more abundant, apparently. But again, as you can see there, they have the, you gotta look at the rostrum that nose between the eyes is more arrow shaped. So it's a cambrous, so it's a native. And uh, speaking of more native species, then we got to go over our native Faxonius, which are the ones, again, with the very long elongated pencil or pen shaped rostrum. First, we have the spiny cheek crayfish, Faxonius limosus on the right, uh, which were also far more abundant at what time and a lot more widespread. Their range has gone down quite a bit as have a lot of the crayfish on this list, but it seems spiny cheek crayfish have, have suffered a bit, a bit more uh, from that, but either way, uh, they're still known from, from a lot of places, uh, but they, you know, they've had a tough time with, with virile and rusty crayfish. Allegheny crayfish are our second native Faxonius. They are ranked as S3, which is state rare. And they have also faced population declines. This is sort of a, 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 running, a running thing here with population declines due to invasive crayfish. They've also faced some declines due to human development and pollution. And next, it's, it's good to address probably the most important part of this entire presentation, which is our invasive Faxonius, which were both uh, virile, crusty, virile crayfish and rusty crayfish were both introduced through released pets or released fishing bait. This is something you should never ever do. Do not, if you go fishing or if you're somebody, if you're somebody who likes to go fishing, do not ever release live crayfish anywhere. We will go over this a little bit later because it's, it's, such a crucial thing, but uh, I digress. 
they they compete heavily with native species as has been implied already they're very very adaptable and tolerant of some pretty bad conditions all things considered they're some of the most tolerant of of any crayfish out there and they're they're very abundant they can negatively impact the stability of of entire habitats really and they can spread some some unique aquatic fungal diseases to other aquatic organisms of course you you may say like uh, well they, if they're incredibly abundant surely they are a plentiful food source which is true but you know there's there's a lot of other negative aspects on here that that honestly are are reducing their value <laughs> You know, in that regard, they are, of course, abundant. They're good food sources. A lot of people like eating viral crayfish. They get quite large. But there are, in my opinion, and in a lot of other experts' opinions, a lot more negatives than there are positives. Obviously, if they weren't around, then we wouldn't have more, all of these fungal diseases going around that they transfer. And as we will, that we will detail a little bit later, um, they can they can affect the overall stability of these habitats. And another what, what invasive part of the world did these two uh, invasive crayfish come from? I believe they came from the western portion, the central to western portion of the U.S. They're they're not native to the eastern portion of the U.S. I don't know specifically. Um, I'll have to look more at that, I don't recall, but I, I do believe they're in the, they're, they're not native to the East Coast. That's what I know. <laughs> um, a species that is native to the East Coast, but isn't native to Maryland is uh, the red swamp crayfish, which is another really, really bad invasive that we have here. Also released <laughs> through released bait, uh, and also there, there have been plenty of releases through commercial aquaculture as they, they farmed them for various reasons. But either way, they're, they're now very, very common in swampy areas um, along the coastal plain. And they can also be very problematic for similar reasons to our invasive Faxonius that we went over earlier. But they, in, they inhabit entirely different habitats uh, a lot of the time, which can, can facilitate a lot more uh, damage because they're, they're now in places that crayfish aren't really supposed to be in in Maryland or very few species of crayfish reside in these sort of swampy areas. So the, their overabundance is definitely causing a problem. But we do have one native Procambrus, which is the White River crayfish. Inhabits fairly similar habitats, but is more, um, as the name would imply, <laughs> is more fond of, of creeks and, and larger rivers at times. And they can persist in places where, where red swamp crayfish are, but they've definitely seen reductions in their overall range due to uh, virile crayfish and uh, red swamp crayfish. And just for just to hit home on these invasive crayfish, because they're important to identify, you, if, if you see these invasive crayfish anywhere where they've not been reported, I'll detail this a little bit towards the end, um, please report them. And I hope this key will help you out a little bit. Obviously, as we mentioned a little earlier, you have to look at the rostrum. If the rostrum is that sort of pencil shape, and then you observe the general body. If it's got two rusty spots on the sides of the carapace, then you have a rusty crayfish. And if it's got a very narrow areola, then it is a viral crayfish. If you check the claws, and it has these very striking red tubercles or red coloration, then it is likely a red swamp crayfish. This is as simplified as I can get it. It gets a little bit deeper than this, but this should be 90% reliable uh, either way. Now that we've gotten those out of the way, we can address some of the more 
interesting crayfish that we have here, the burrowing crayfish. Uh, a lot of people see these as sort of a nuisance. Uh, devil crayfish are probably one of our most famous crayfish species as they are seen as kind of a nuisance in, in lawns and yards, uh, anywhere that's kind of swampy that somebody owns property of along the bay, they're, they're very common. Uh, also, we have upland burrowing crayfish in Western Maryland. We have digger crayfish way down um, in, the, um, in the lower Eastern shore region and little brown mud bugs, which are invasive in um, Garrett County. And they, these also play a very big role in maintaining balance within, within soil habitats, within sort of fossorial areas in, in these marshy underground regions. Uh, and they serve as food sources for a plethora of other fossorial species. And they, they, play, they play a bigger role than people give them credit for, for sure. They have very interesting habits as well. I, I would highly recommend reading more into their habits and their behavior because it is, it's very fascinating how they're able to live most of their lives just underground like this while other crayfish live completely different lives in in say large rivers or even small streams. Now that we've gone over crayfish, yes. Could, could yeah. you go back? I want to comment on the brewing yeah. crayfish. Uh, sure. This happened a couple, several decades ago when before global warming, it, some lakes around here froze over and everything died except when, the, when we could walk through when the ice melted. There, somebody showed me, we looked down into a brewing crayfish and there a dozen species of plants and animals that survived with it down in the burrow where it was 50 Indeed, degrees. Indeed, that's very important as well. Yeah, and so it's- They a, create it's, entire networks that can, that can help um, secondary burrowers or secondary species that, that inhabit previously built underground structures to really blossom. And they, they rely upon these crayfish. That's a good- that's a good yeah. thing to mention. So it's called symbiosis. Hmm. Indeed. Coevolution. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we've gone over crayfish, we got to go over some of the other crustacean relatives. First, we have amphipods, which are very, very tiny, but they're found in so many different aquatic habitats. They're found in swamps and springs and large rivers and small, small tiny streams. But they're, they're also really, really crucial to maintaining habitats. They're very plentiful food sources. Crayfish eat the heck out of them. Uh, they're also very good at breaking down dead, dead and decaying matter. They are just generally, excuse me, um, a very good sort of, they're, they're nearly planktonic, they're so small. So it's always good to have a base, a, a, a kind of planktonic based ecosystems and they serve that role very well. Uh, and a lot of people don't know this, but one of the rarest species in the world is in Maryland and it is a amphipod. And it is in with, uh, it's within Rock Creek Park Technically in DC, but we'll say we'll say Maryland. They're also they're they're really really sensitive to human disturbance and pollution. But again, they're crucial for maintaining health of these, especially of these spring microhabitats, where they've they've evolved here. They have a purpose there, and a lot of people are probably thinking right now, well, there this just a tiny uh, a tiny little amphipod in, in mountain streams who, who should care about that. But I promise you that without these guys, it just wouldn't be the same. They really do serve an important role. And they're, they're so unique, especially for, for Maryland. It's, it's worth preserving them. They're only, they're only found in, in a, a, a handful of, of these mountain streams only here. So I would recommend you 
read more into uh, the Hay Spring Amphipod. Very, very fascinating. Is this a good time for me to comment about the Hay Spring Amphipod? Sure. <laughs> okay, so everybody, are you ready? This is called Citizen Science. There was this guy named Mr. Hay uh, about two decades ago. He was in downtown District of Columbia in a uh, looking at a small spring and he said, oh my God, what is this? He didn't recognize it. And we got a uh, carcinologist to check it out. And they said, oh my God, it's a brand new species never discovered before in the world. Um, so the guy who called, it was the genius, Stiegel Bromus. He said, okay, Mr. Hay, thank you so much. I'm gonna call us Stiegel Bromus Hay in honor of you as a citizen science. Okay, and then we looked all over and I was working for the Endangered Species Office at the time. And we looked all over and that was just, just a few, it died in the downtown DC area because of, you know, what, what District of Columbia did to their landscape. But it survived in Rock Creek Park upstream in these little mountain springs. And I put it on the National Endangered Species list and I was required to have a common name and there was no common name. So guess what I called it? It was a spring amphipod. I called it Hay's Spring Amphipod in honor of Mr. Hay. And by the way, he was very happy as a citizen science to be recognized for what he had just done. So all of you out there become citizen scientists. If you don't recognize something, go ahead. Let's, and maybe you've got a new species and you'll become a famous citizen science scientist. Too. Indeed, very important for if you're interested in nature, go out there, explore, look for tiny things. It's often the, the really small species that go unnoticed, uh, that go undiscovered. Speaking of which, we have next isopods, also known as roly polies, by practically any kid you talk to. <laughs> there are several different groups of isopods in Maryland. Uh, we have some aquatic ones and we have some terrestrial ones. Uh, but they're, they're also very proficient in breaking down dead and, dead and decaying matter. That is another sort of common feature of uh, aquatic and terrestrial crustaceans. Uh, they can also stimulate a lot of growth of, bec of um, beneficial microbes, which is a fairly unique aspect to them, yet still very obviously very important to preserve these guys because they offer a completely unique um, ecosystem service. And uh, if you go anywhere near the bay, you'll probably be familiar with the sea slaters or the wharf roaches that hang around the, the rocks along beaches and you have water slaters, which are common in streams, and you have wood louses like armadillidium, which you can find just by flipping over a log practically anywhere, even if you're in an urban area. Uh, and we do have some endangered isopods. Uh, we have several, actually, mostly in the genus, uh, um, Heike, how do you pronounce that? Heike, Dodia. <laughs> I haven't practiced pronouncing that. Either way, similar to the Hay Spring Amphipod, uh, these endangered ones are, of course, also crucial for maintaining the overall health of their respective aquatic environments and are very, very sensitive. So I urge you to support the conservation of all of these endangered, very tiny crustaceans. Next, we got crabs. Again, probably our most famous crustacean in the whole state, the blue crab. One of the most famous crustaceans in the world. So glad to have them here. But uh, at one point, they weren't doing so well here. Uh, and it was thanks to conservation that they are now back to uh, very respectable population numbers. And they're very, you know, they're doing healthy, uh, fantastic. Nowadays, despite being harvested commercially, 
uh, we've really figured that out. That's a great conservation success story and they're still very commercially valuable. Of course, we also have several smaller crab species that fill a variety of roles. On the left there, we have Atlantic sand crabs, which are burrowing crabs. And we have other crabs that inhabit uh, the open water, like swimming crabs, which the Atlantic blue crab is a swimming crab. And we have some other more terrestrial crabs, like fiddler crabs and marsh crabs. We have several, and they're very, very important. I've said the word important many times, but <laughs> I'd like to hit home on that word. Uh, for the bay ecosystem especially. They're also proficient at breaking down dead and decaying matter <laughs> and serve as, uh, as predators, or rather they serve as food. They also serve as predators. Blue crabs are, are good predators, uh, but they serve as food for a lot of different predators in the bay, along the bay. A lot of fish eat the larval planktonic forms of crabs and a lot of large bird species um, eat adult crabs. We do have some invasive crabs here. We have the Chinese mitten crab. Thankfully, not very common, but still very important to, re to report if you see any. And the Asian shore crab, uh, both introduced accidentally via boat hole fouling uh, and ballast water. Uh, and they, they're, they're, the Chinese mitten crab particularly is something that we really need to look out for. They can spell some, some pretty bad things for the bay. They can facilitate a lot of stream bank erosion. They can host a lot of really dangerous pathogens and they compete heavily with native crabs. So if you see a Chinese mitten crab, please report it, <laughs> please do. Uh, and finally, we've got barnacles. A lot of people don't even know what barnacles are, but they are crustaceans. They form this sort of calcified uh, casing around themselves, but they are crustaceans and they are very important to the entire Chesapeake Bay ecosystem, similar to oysters. They are filter feeders and they filter and clean the entire bay, practically. They do a fantastic job of that, and without them, the bay would not be nearly as healthy. So, you know, <laughs> there, there you go. They're also very good food sources for other animals. You wouldn't think so, but they definitely are. I, I encourage you to read more about uh, barnacles because they are really fascinating and probably one of the most underappreciated crustaceans out there. Uh, and lastly, we've got the other sort of planktonic crustaceans. Grass shrimp aren't necessarily planktonic as adults, but they are as larvae. Um, shrimp, really, really important in the bay as food sources. A as I'm sure you're, you're aware, shrimp are just completely necessary for the bay, for the bay ecosystem. Uh, we have fairy shrimp which are also crucial for maintaining healthy ephemeral pool habitats. That's where we have our spotted salamanders and our marbled salamanders and all of our ephemeral pool loving species. Fairy shrimps are instrumental in maintaining that whole process, especially along the ephemeral pool habitats um, in certain parts of the bay. Uh, and we have, as I, as I mentioned, before we have the specific planktonic crustaceans that stay planktonic like Daphnia and copepods, which are the basis of the entire aquatic food web practically. Food for a lot of really small organisms. That is what you need to maintain ecosystem health. You gotta start there, it's gotta be plentiful. So as, as we've of course, of course gathered by this entire presentation, I hope uh, that, that you believe crustaceans are truly important, especially crayfish. I'd like to, to put a lot of emphasis on crayfish here. They're, more, they're much more important than people realize. Their, their sensitivity to pollution allows us to really gauge the health of streams and wetlands. 
They can stimulate a lot of unique beneficial processes, as I mentioned earlier. They can break down a lot of dead and decaying matter. Isopods can stimulate bacterial, beneficial bacterial growth. And we've got plenty of other uh, beneficial ecosystem services that they provide. Uh, however small they are still instrumental and they must be appreciated. Their absence can, can cause immense degradation and almost structural collapse within a given habitat. I've seen areas, streams where there are no native crayfish. It's just loads and loads of viral crayfish. And every single time I see that, it's not a very healthy stream. <laughs> uh, and there's reasons for that. These, these invasive crayfish, these invasive species aren't meant to be here. And they really do cause a lot of issues with the balance of habitats. Even at a glance, you can see these habitats and you could say, they, they seem okay, but it's a, it's a slow process. And we really need to address this issue before it affects the entire bay because we have all these headwater streams that these invasive crayfish are, are inhabiting. By headwater, I mean very small, um, very small streams that eventually feed into our, our creeks, which eventually feed into our rivers, which feed into our bay. So those small streams, even though they appear small, are so important for maintaining our bay health, uh, if not more important than maintaining the health of our larger rivers like the Potomac. Um, so these crayfish and crustaceans are, are such a huge part of that. And as I've mentioned, of course, before, they are commercially valuable. They're valuable to humans. They provide us with a lot of benefits. We can eat them and their food sources with, for countless animals uh, at varying life stages, as I've mentioned. So protection efforts for these crustaceans um, vary, although they're unfortunately not very commonly focused on. Uh, there, there's not that many crayfish protection efforts, which is honestly really unfortunate. So I would highly highly urge you to support the conservation of crayfish any, any way you can. Um, just, to, just to get the word out there, you know, it's really important. Uh, states need to pay more attention, especially to the harvesting of crayfish. Uh, rare species might be, might be at risk. A lot of crayfish over harvesting has practically never been studied. So it's, it's something that needs to be addressed, similar to, you know, harvesting fish. But there, there are no limits on crayfish, and we don't know what, what that could do. Uh, furthermore, eliminating invasive crayfish, even though it's a really unfortunate situation that they're here, it's practically impossible to eliminate them. But controlling the spread is what we need to focus on here. Uh, and, and researchers are really working on trying to find other solutions like biocontrol agents, although that's a whole other can of worms, biocontrol agents, uh, either way. The, probably the most important thing is that we should really identify sites that are at risk, sites that have, say, the, the rare, the state-listed um, state assuminate crayfish that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and they, these should all be monitored for invasive species, mon monitored for the health of, of these crayfish, especially the headwater streams, as I mentioned earlier. So now, of course, you want to know what you can do. So you got to uh, first try your best to familiarize yourself. Use the keys on this presentation. Uh, familiarize yourself with, with the crayfish we have here. I would also recommend checking out the, the Maryland crayfish key. It's a very detailed identification key. Crayfish identification can be a bit of a bit of a handful, but if you would like to know more about how to how to do detailed crayfish identification, because it's not always easy, uh, I would highly recommend checking out the Maryland Crayfish Key. Quick search on Google can can turn that up. Uh, and as with practically all of our invasive crayfish, which were introduced via via pet or bait release 
never do that, <laughs> please. And do not transport any of the virile crayfish, rusty crayfish, anything like that. Don't introduce anything new. Uh, never, never transport anything, anything alive anywhere, especially these crayfish. We don't want them spreading any faster than they already are. Uh, but they, you, you have to do your best to, to just watch out for all of these. Keep tabs on on your local streams. Uh, you know, you only have to flip over a few rocks. Really, you can you can find crayfish. Plenty of these. Uh, crustaceans that that we've detailed today, uh, uh, and all, of course you got to keep your local streams and wetlands clean, clear of trash. Pollution is something that crayfish are affected by, and that that our native uh, crayfish are affected by, and that VRL crayfish are less affected by. So got to keep our our streams and wetlands clean to help support our sensitive native species. You have to minimize your impact, your carbon footprint. Uh, Try not to disturb the wet, these, these wetland and stream habitats as much as you can. And again, just spread the word about, about how fascinating crayfish actually are, their importance, what they can do. Uh, and a, a good thing to do to sort of spread the word uh, and just report general sightings of crayfish is to use iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a wonderful resource. If you don't use it already, I highly recommend using it. It also lets you know where certain crayfish species are um, localized so that if you find, say, a rusty crayfish in a place that have not been previously reported, then you can report it on there and you'll know that, they, that it has not been reported there before. But so I'd like to uh, comment, that's about it for what I got. I comment here. on your last point, Amy, Emilio. Uh, sure. Report sightings of crustaceans if you find any of those endangered ones. Yes, of course. Like, if you find if you find out, rare rare species, please report those too. Yeah, and the state is much more likely to fund protection of that site. Much yes. more likely sure. to control the pollution. And, and do everything. And of course, in terms of hay spring amphipod, since it's on the federal list, uh, it resulted in stopping the pollution of Rock Creek Park. Yes, it stopped a major pollution. It made it the federal approval was not legal because it was federally listed. And it actually stopped the pollution of Rock Creek Park. So if you find hay spring amphipod, which by the way, I got an email that you're looking for and elsewhere to see if they can stop the federal authorization funding or carried out of any action that may threaten any species. This is a pursuit in section four of this act. So everybody uh, look as you look for crayfish, if you find an endangered one, uh, then you may be able to use it to save the areas you're trying to save. Indeed. Even look in the, uh, even if you've got a small spring near you, I'd recommend looking, mm -hmm. looking uh, in that area. As, as Mark and I have mentioned, the Hay Spring Amphipod has been found in only a handful of streams, only in Rock Creek Park. So who's to say that, that there aren't other um, endemic rare amphipods to springs near you. You'll never know if you don't if you don't look. So I would highly recommend just just looking. It's uh, it's fairly easy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, with that said, I I hope I, I taught you all everything. I, I hope I wasn't I wasn't boring. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate you all listening regardless. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was incredible. I, I did put your resource, just Google that and that will come up. We do have a couple of hands up already and some people will put their questions in the chat. Sue, why don't you go ahead? I think you were first. Excellent. Uh, wonderful presentation, Emilio. Thank you. Yes, wonderful. So um, when taking pictures um, for iNaturalists, um, Obviously, it's usually pretty easy to get a picture from the top, even if it's in the water. But is it also valuable to get the underside photo? Yes. 
that's something I didn't mention because using the underside for crayfish identification is, is quite tricky. But if you can get a picture of the dorsal region, which is the top, mm -hmm. the ventral region, which is the bottom, mm -hmm. and try to get a picture of the side. Because especially for rusty crayfish, they have a, they have a rusty spot on the side of the carapace. Okay. So just try your best. It doesn't have to be the, the best photo in the world. Just make sure the areola is visible, the rostrum is visible, um, and you'll be pretty much 95% set for an identification on iNaturalist. I go through crayfish observations every day on iNaturalist, so I'll probably be on there to help you. Okay, super, thank you. Uh, could the next person just unmute because I can't see who it was with the next question. I think maybe it was me. Um, agreed, Amelia, that was very interesting. Thank you. Thank One you, I'm question. Glad. <laughs> you mentioned how um, streams with invasive crayfish look are, are such are, are much poorer quality. Are they poor quality because the invasive crayfish are there, or can the invasive crayfish survive in the poor quality streams? It can be both. So it can be that there, there at one point the stream was healthy and, and virile crayfish, let's say virile crayfish uh, invaded it and there were common crayfish there, there were some native crayfish there. And then the stream degraded over time, which pushed out the natives. Or conversely, it could have been that the stream was already, you know, kind of healthy or rather, or it could have already been kind of degraded and the virile crayfish likely made it worse. Um, they can do that depending on the substrate of the stream. They build a lot of burrows along the side of the stream bank, which can facilitate a lot of erosion. Uh, and as I mentioned, they spread diseases as well. So they can definitely degrade the health of streams just by being there. But there are some, certainly some places where I've been where I've seen virile crayfish and some native crayfish coexisting fairly well and the stream is still fairly healthy. But most of the time, uh, if virile crayfish have been there for a while, they, they do tend to degrade it for sure. Thank you. Any more questions? I see Lily, you put in the chat fossorial. Fossorial means uh, a organism that lives primarily underground. How do I should have I should have mentioned that, sorry. How, how do you spell it? Uh, F-O-S-S-O-R-I-A-L, I believe, fossorial, yeah. Okay. Okay, I would like to remind everybody when we first started, there were 10 sites that you mentioned needed to be protected, like on the Potomac River, Atkins, Atkins, what, Ute Creek, Bell Grove, um, many, many sites. Everybody who said they were gonna send uh, a description of what needs to be done, please do so. And I will wait a week till I get, till you've had your time to write it up, what you want the Sierra Club to do to protect a particular site uh, that has crustaceans. And so please, everybody send that to Lily and me and Emilio, uh, what you want us to do. And then in about a week, I'll summarize it and we'll work with the, with the Sierra Club uh, staff, people that work on action items uh, to let's focus and save those areas. So will everybody send that, that summary? We'll wait a week until we receive that from everybody. You can also stick it in the chat real quick, the creek you mentioned, that would help us too. Um, I, I tried to write down some of them. I had a question about the photographing. How close can you get? How reactive are they to humans? I haven't done this since I was a kid, so now I'm more interested and in, I'm going to a nature right. center tomorrow in a swamp, so I'm hopeful. I'll get right. to see something. Uh, as, as many of you are aware, I'm sure, just by the fact of, just by how crayfish look, they can be kind of cantankerous. They have large claws. Uh, so pretty much all of them are willing to pinch you if you give them the opportunity. So 
yeah, I'm sure you saw in my presentation in the um, in the final slide or one of the the second to last slide. Uh, I'm holding the crayfish by the very end of the carapace before the tail starts, and that's a safe way to hold them. They can't pinch you if you hold them there, but if you grab them at practically any other way, they can reach around and pinch you. Uh, so in in that regard, holding crayfish is pretty easy if you get a hang of it. Photographing them, as long as you have a container, container, you know, about this big, only has to be like eight or eight or so, seven or eight uh, inches in diameter. It, the color doesn't matter. Just to fill with water, a little bit of water, just enough so the crayfish can breathe because they, they do use water to breathe. They can breathe there for a little bit, but ultimately they need to be in water. Uh, then you just take a picture from the top and then you pick them up. You take a picture of the ventral region, holding it flat in front of you with your camera. And then you can take a picture of the side while you're holding it or whichever way you see fit. Uh, as you saw in my presentation, taking pictures of them from the dorsal region from the top is pretty easy. And most of the time that is sufficient for identification. Uh, but for true identification, sometimes you, you definitely need the, the underside and the side. So yeah, just get yourself a nice container. <laughs> it can be a, a Tupperware container. That works perfectly fine. I've used Tupperware containers for a long time to photograph critters mm -hmm. and aquatic, aquatic stuff. So I don't know if everybody noticed, but virtually all of those pictures were taken by Amelia and they were incredible quality. I guess my other quality was, did you have uh, microscopes or you know magnifying glasses for some of those pictures or that sort of thing? Uh, well, my camera itself is good enough to just get flat out decent pictures of amphipods, which are super tiny. Uh, but obviously a lot of people only have say a phone camera. So I would recommend getting <laughs> uh, you know, on Amazon, you can get them for like $20, a little magnification device that pretty much makes your, your phone into a magnifying glass. So if you want to take a photo of an amphipod, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, but yeah, for crayfish, you shouldn't have too hard of a time. Just make sure, again, that, that everything is visible, that the areola and the rostrum are visible. <laughs> This is Ed. I've got a question about terrestrial isopods. Are they all introduced in Maryland? Are there native species? There are plenty of, of non-native terrestrial isopods mm -hmm. in Maryland, um, but I don't think any of them are listed technically as being invasive. There, we still have plenty of, of native isopods, although granted, I don't think much research has gone into how the non-native isopods affect the native ones. I really wish there was more research into that. But we, but yes, we have plenty of native isopods, more than terrestrial isopods, more than non-native. I have the impression that all, all the ones in my garden are the two introduced ones or non-native ones, the Armadillidium vulgari and the mm. other one, the Porcellia scabber. But I haven't right. really checked them. They just kind of look like the ones I've seen all my life, but I haven't tried to identify them. But they can right. be very common in, you know, in suburbia, in gardens. Yeah, as with a lot of, a lot of these invasive species, they do tend to be tolerant of urban and suburban habitats more so than the native species. Isopods are pretty, pretty difficult to identify at times, but. Do there are there native ones that roll into balls? Because that's armadillidium. I don't know. You know, that's an easy way to tell that uh, genus, I guess. Yeah, I I think it's only it's only a few that that really roll into a ball. I, I believe you're right that armadillidium is the most famous one. I don't I don't know as much as I should about uh, the terrestrial isopods. Okay. Thanks. Emil, this is Mel. I've got a quick question going back to Lily's um, discussion on how you can safely take pictures sure. of some of these 
uh, crustaceans? Yeah, with the devil crayfish in the backyard, uh, you know, the very hard to see. And I was wondering if I stuck an endoscope camera on there, a snake camera, the kind with a really bright light at the end, would right. that be damaging to them? I've yet to like do to, that in, like in to fear stick it of in. blinding them. Right, no, not, like not to stick it in them, but you know, it's got a light at the end of it and uh, it's, it's a rather bright light. Right, you mean like into the burrow? Yeah. Oh, I mean, no, that, that shouldn't no. harm them. The, the only thing, the only issue with that is that um, their burrows can actually be extremely deep, oh. like, like more than an arm's length deep, like, like your entire arm deep. Wow. So unless the, unless the camera you've got is really long and is, sometimes it has multiple branching tunnels, oh my then goodness. it's pretty hard to get photos of them in that, in that way. If you want to try, all you'd have to do is take the mud chimney off so that the hole is visible, that's actually mm -hmm. fine. And then you can just put the mud chimney back on once you're done. You can? Yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah, it doesn't, wow. It doesn't harm anything. An easier way uh, yeah. that I've heard a lot about to catch burrowing crayfish is to fish for them. You take some I've fishing line too. and you tie some bacon on the end and you just uh -huh. stick it in the hole and wait for them to come up and grab it. When they grab it, you just pull them out. It's as easy as that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you get to say hi. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, thank you. And now you you've got me right back in. even more enthusiastic about finding what's in the mud chimney. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. No problem. Could you, uh, Ed here, could you comment on which crayfish are still left in the highly polluted Potomac River in the DC area? Not to mention Anacostia. I wonder if there's any crayfish left there at all. Mm. Uh, well, funny that you mentioned that because the Anacostia is one of the only places in Maryland uh, where assuminate crayfish are, which are the S2, the our rarest crayfish. They oh. are within the Anacostia drainage, and I have found them there before. They're, they're arguably most common within that drainage. Only in certain parts of it, granted, but they are there. Probably in the we, There are just stream. plenty of other Sagan. Probably in the headwater streams. I was kind of kidding about the Anacostia, yeah. but because yeah, I know it has a lot of tributaries. Right. But what about just say a key bridge or whatever? Are there many crayfish left there? Uh, for natives, I'm not sure if there are many natives left. I'm sure Vera crayfish are just thriving. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think rusty crayfish have made it down there. They're, they're more localized to the Frederick Washington okay. County uh, area of the Potomac River and a little bit up in the Monocacy. Uh, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I doubt that a lot of our native crayfish have persisted in the, in the DC area, um, especially if some of our fish are having a hard time down there. But that could always change. The, the DC area's Potomac River health is is still steadily increasing, and we're getting a lot of a lot of good numbers there. So who knows? Let's hope. Yeah. Any other questions? Hey, Leo, this is Ann Kateri. Yes. Hello. So, hi, honey. So I have a question in terms of these invasive species. I mean, what are our options? I mean, how is an elimination? a possibility or is this all about containment? I mean, what what do we do about the ones that are already there? Uh, well, I, I believe I briefly mentioned that on the presentation, but it's practically impossible to just flat out try to eliminate all of the invasive crayfish that we have here because we the bay is so expansive, it branches out into thousands and thousands of tiny streams, and you would have to sample every single one of those uh, and and just clean them all out to get every possible instance, every so possible then the, so specimen. So what's the best option for, you know, um, kind of decreasing that spread then? You had yeah. mentioned something that I was unfamiliar with, something, I think you used the term bio, yeah, a, uh, a biological I can, control. I can agent. speak to uh, biological control. Uh, before a permit is is given out for biological control, you have to prove that it's not going to be harmful to other species. And the rate at which biological controls are bad is now only 
before the rules went into effect, it was 50%. So it's a good thing yeah. to do. Now, what, what you would do is go to where these invasive crayfishes are native and find out what's controlling it there and yes. find something native that's controlling it there and and make that's a possibility to bring here to control that same uh, invasive here. And oh, what an interesting yes. concept. Okay. For, for okay. instance, there are a lot of invasive plants here that have like a fungal control or an insect control agent in their native habitat that they don't have here. So the idea is you bring in the insects or the fungus, the fungus is more of an uncommon biological control because that's more complicated, but you bring in like a beetle or something that eats the plant in its native habitat to Maryland, you have to do a lot of studying to make sure that that beetle won't affect other beetles or other plants in the area. But the idea is that it'll eat what it's supposed to eat, which is the native, the non-native plant, uh, and it'll take care of it. Uh, it's that that's not been a successful method in the past, but it is now proven to be pretty successful. And I do hope we find something like that for uh, our invasive crayfish. It's pretty hard to find biological controls for aquatic species for a variety of reasons, but it's something that's always possible. Clearly, their their bio, whatever biological control they have in their native habitat isn't here because they're invasive. So there's got to be something, you know. Yeah, just to give a classic example, how many of you have seen mile a minute vine? Oh, yeah. You know, it used to grow six inches a day. And now the bugs that I actually released it as a park ranger in the Gouda Woods, uh, it reduced it to one inch a day. And so it's become naturalized. At Guilford Woods, Lily, we found one specimen mile a minute here, one way over there, one way over there. So it used to be one of the worst. It no longer kills the trees. So yeah. that's, and, and the first one was for purple loose strife. After the new rules went to effect, that is proven good. And now the latest is Japanese knotweed. And everybody, please report to me where there's a large population because Kathy Stringler with DNA with DNR is going to is rearing the bugs and going to release them in November. So anybody knows a massive amount of Japanese knotweed, please let me know. It and we will report it to her. I want to let everybody know that we have we're hosting from a borrowed space tonight, so we have a hard deadline of nine o'clock because the office where I am is going to close. Um, so I wanted to uh, Galen, uh, could you uh, make your announcement, or do you have audio? Uh, yeah, I, I have audio. Um, so I posted in the chat there uh, as well that the Wildlife Corridors, Wildlife and Plant Corridors group, which is also a, a group of the Natural Places Committee, um, is working on looking at connecting existing stream corridors and other things through in various ways through uh, habitat restoration. And um, we're meeting next week on Thursday night at eight o'clock. So if you're interested in that, um, the it's on the CR Club calendar and the registration link is there in the chat. Great, thank you. Um, I also want to mention that July 7th at 7 p.m. virtual possibility of in-person, hybrid virtual and in-person depending on CR Club policies by then. But um, we're going to have a uh, meeting celebrating Madam Woman Creek and all the, the importance, the ecological and the human importance of uh, Madam Woman Creek on July 7th. So if you go to uh, uh, MarylandSierra.org slash calendar, just scroll down to July 7th or uh, was it June 24th or July 24th, Galen? Oh, it's yet June because it's next week, June, so June, yeah. June 24th and July 7th. If you go to that calendar, mbcr.org slash calendar, you can go to those events. Does anybody else have an interesting event they want to share? Oh, oh I, I, by the way, uh, if I have found people like Emilio, if you want him to come and look for crayfish and other crustaceans where you live, there's a good chance he'll come, particularly if you pay his cost of transportation. That would be fantastic. I'd love to explore any place you have around you. 
I've got but you know what's there. I've got plenty of supplies. I survey streams on my own all the time. So what did you say, Lily? I was joking. I said, I've got a place in the Bahamas. Will you come and <laughs> check it out for me? No. I'll be your assistant, Emilio. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> OK. Mark, anything Can I ask else? A question. Oh, sure. Um, I work with a lot of schools. And actually, we're doing a project <laughs> about microplastics. And so when you mentioned that, uh, you know, you mentioned a couple of times that there's pollution that impacts these, the crayfish. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more, like what are the types of pollution that affect them? And also has microplastics been coming up at all, and specifically microfibers, but microplastics in general? Hmm. Um, in terms of microplastics, that's a really interesting question on whether they're they're affecting crayfish I I know for sure that they that they are um, you know affecting a variety of different aquatic habitats probably even more so than than larger plastics just because they're so tiny and they're they're so difficult to trace um, so I, I do wish I, I knew a lot, a lot more about that but I I, I would say that it that it that it likely does play a part in pollution especially because it's so common nowadays it's microplastics are in practically every soap now uh but in in terms of other pollutants that crayfish would be sensitive to obviously there's chemical pollutants that come from factories or or plants nearby there's as i mentioned plastic pollution um a lot of people just chuck random parts or random trash into streams and that that can pollute a lot uh interestingly there's also some evidence to say that uh discarded fishing lures is also playing a part in the pollution of these streams because they they contain a lot of really really uh dangerous chemicals if ingested or dissolved into something or eaten uh so, you know, you have a fish that say eats a discarded fishing lure and it dies and it spreads that all around. And there's a lot of research being done into what that could possibly do. Um, and there's, there's a lot of issues with, you know, in an urban setting, you have tons of um, uh, impervious surfaces that will spread lots of chemicals, lots of, you know, stuff that's sitting on the road, road salts into these streams, and that causes a whole host of problems, um, can cause erosion, can introduce some weird chemicals as well. So I'm sure microplastics play a part in that, especially in urban areas where, you know, you've discarded a lot of that in the trash and just gets washed into streams when you have a big rain. Yeah, hopefully that's helpful. I just think this was an amazing talk and for, for someone as early in his career, which I hope will be long and, and predict will be <laughs> and illustrious uh, and lots of support from family and friends and mentors who you are <laughs> informing right back at them. So thank you so yeah. much. Let's have a little round of applause there for Emilio. For that Yay, thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of compliments in the chat also. Really. So, yeah. Right, I saw some of those. Thank you all. <laughs>